Steve Galair, August Falter Rove. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of our new series on mixed sex prisons. Um, we've put together an amazing panel of experts from around the world, and today we are going to examine this policy um, in the round. But before we get stuck in, I want to bring you some breaking news. Uh, we learned last night that a fourth male in Ireland is about to be sent to the women's estate. Um, this person was found to be in possession of almost a million messages discussing sexual abuse of children and many images. Um, they've been found guilty of possession of images and production of images, um, which the Guardian described as depraved and the worst they'd seen unique. Um, now, um, in more normal times, um, the way we operated as a society was that we, if a man was convicted of being a paedophile um, or indeed of rape or attempted rape or um, had a stated intention to rape and murder women, those men were always locked up to keep women safe. Now in the uh, upside down, um, in Ireland and in other jurisdictions, we are locking those men in with women. So it is likely that this uh, male who was um, sentenced for to three years and will be sent to the female estate that has already been stated, that he will either go to Docus or Limerick. So Docus is where is an open prison in Ireland and it's for women to stay with their very small children. Um, and he could be sent there. Now that sounds far-fetched. However, it's not. The first ever male that we became aware of who uh, was identified as trans and was sent to the female estate, they were sent to Docus in the first instance. So we truly are in the upside down when we are sending convicted paedophiles to an open prison that has um, mothers and babies. Um, we will be looking at the policy in great detail today, but um, our position as a human rights and advocacy group is very clear. We at the Countess um, state, and, we, and we, we believe very strongly that males should not be housed with females. Males should not be um, in female spaces, regardless of how they identify. Um, as we know, and we are, um, driven by data and we are fully evidence-based. The data is very clear. Trans-identified males um, commit violent and sexual offences at the same rate as all males, if not higher. Um, in Ireland already, we're dealing with um, skewed data, um, but um, essentially the trans-identified males in prison um, are um, at the moment, 100% of them in Ireland who are in the female estate um, um, are part of the highest band. So the, the most um, serious criminals are locked in with women who, um, and this is to be true in all jurisdictions, women tend to be, 95% um, of them tend to be non-violent, um, only 5% would be violent. Um, they are extremely vulnerable. It is safe to say they're the most vulnerable cohort in society um, because um, they tend to, criminologists will say that the, so many of them are victims of male um, violence and abuse that in fact, male violence is the pathway to incarceration for females. So that cohort is now um, having to share their estate with um, dangerous um, criminals. Now, when we talk about the danger that they pose the women, um, our position is very clear. Um, we don't think that we need to debate whether or not these men pose a risk to women because it's evidenced by, uh, objectively, by the policy that has been put in place by the Irish state. So in Ireland, um, these males are accompanied by two prison guards at all times who do not leave their side. So it's very clear by that, that um, the prison service in Ireland is well aware 
how dangerous they are um, for the women there, or they wouldn't have put in place this um, protocol. Um, furthermore, it's very obvious that that protocol could as easily be put in place in Mountjoy. Um, it is typically used to separate prisoners who are um, deemed very dangerous or who need to be um, separated. Um, so without um, further ado, I think um, it's time to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, I started um, getting in touch with uh, our first panelist um, at the very beginning um, because I was so struck by her words, by her advocacy, by her honesty, by her um, courage. Um, so it's a great honor to introduce her here today. Um, Heather Mason is a Canadian woman. She um, has spent time herself in inside a prison um, and she's an advocate for female prisoners. Um, she is an organizer and she is a co-founder of the Canadian Sex-Based Women's Rights Group. Um, and she's been recently um, protesting this policy of mixed sex jails, of housing trans-identified males with women in Canada. Um, we are absolutely delighted to hear you today, to have you here today to chat to us. Heather, hello. Hi, thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, yes, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me and it's been awesome chatting with you about prisons. Yes, um, I'm delighted we could finally make this happen. I was texting you saying, you know, please bear with us. Um, I am probably the worst person to be doing anything to do with technology. It's not my forte. So uh, we're, but we're here now and the point is that we're here and we can, we can chat. And so, you know, in many ways, things like Zoom and um, being online is a blessing because we, I don't have to go to Canada and you don't have to come to Ireland. But, um, you know, as we both know, th there are parallels. Um, in Canada, you have self-ID. But before we get into policy and practice, which is our thing here at the Countess, can you just talk to me a little bit about your background and your story, your personal story and background? Yes. Yeah, so, um... Everything kind of started when I was really young. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom was a drug addict. I had a predator for a stepfather. Um, a lot of bad things happened when I was younger. I ran away from home when I was 16. I started dating older men and getting into drugs. Um, and then my drug use just kind of escalated. Um, dealt with a lot of abuse, like domestic. Um, and then I started getting into fentanyl and it was like downhill after that. So that's an opiate. And I first got arrested in 2014. And then, so I spent pretty much more time in jail than I did out of jail from 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 2018. And then of course my parole. So I've been in and out for, um, quite a few times in the last few years, but I um, haven't been in trouble for four years. So that's really good. That's a record for me. <laughs> Actually in Ireland, they say, you know, um, um, people in the field will say that women in Ireland end up doing a life sentence, but they do it in tiny, you know, three months, six months, six months um, in increments. Um, and we've seen evidence of um, judges um, increasingly incarcerating women who are homeless, who have no fixed abode. So it's almost seen as well, they'll be safer in a cell um, and they'll be fed. And um, so obviously there's a whole um, very complex framework of, um, you know, often drug abuse, drug addiction, violent relationships um, that lead women to be incarcerated. And um, like in your experience, how do women cope with prison? And, and what are they, um, how do they, you know, on their own, how do they organize themselves? How do they, how does it work? How do they cope with separation from family and from children? And what is prison life like for women? Everyone takes it differently. Um, with me, it was easier to not think about, so I have two kids, I have a son and a daughter that my family are raising. Um, so I have agreed to leave them with them until they're old enough to make their own decision. So when I was in, 
I like I would get really upset and it would like my time would go by really slow if I thought about my kids and like so you kind of like isolate um you you pull in and you spend a lot of time in your cell or in your room alone because you don't want to think about like everything you're missing on the outside right um it's it's really emotional a lot of women have a really hard time with it like there's a lot of emotions running in there because um 70 of women that are incarcerated are mothers to children under 18 so mm -hmm. it, that seems to be like the biggest thing is like our children because there's a lot of like who's going to take the kids are they going into foster care are they safe Am I going to get to talk to them? Um, my family was really mad at me. So they didn't let me talk to my daughter for 22 months. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's tough. It's a struggle. There's so many things that we're worrying about because we're, we're usually the caretakers, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that's so important to um, place in the first instance with any conversation about female prisoners is that they, they're, they're paying such a high price beyond the time they're, they are serving. And um, by virtue of the fact of being mothers in Ireland, I think it's 80% are mothers to typically, you know, three children. Um, and like you said, I mean, when a man goes into prison, his partner is raising that family. His family life is on um, intact, untouched really, and it just flows on without it. And I'm sure they miss their father. But when a woman goes into prison, a mother, it just implodes. You know, it, it it can shatter. And it's funny how you said. Well, it's not funny. It's um, sad. It's saddening how you said that. You know, the parents who are can be like society and family seem to. Um, blame mothers at a whole different rate to the, the way they would think about fathers you know it's it's seen as um more egregious um and the mother is sort of punished um so they so they're unique in that regard because of all their uh, responsibilities and the bonds with their with their children um there was a 2006 kelly um study that showed the rates of self-harm amongst female prisoners in ireland compared to male um, and if you crunch it down, women are self-harming at seven times the rate of men. So I think that gives you a good glimpse of just the levels of distress um, amongst women. Um, and so that's really important to remember, you know, we're already talking about this very vulnerable population who are extremely distressed, actively distressed emotionally, psychologically. Um, but in terms of what's been happening in Canada, so um, can you just give us a kind of a background to your self-ID law? I know it came in differently. It came in via your human rights legislation in the same way as in um, Australia. So that was your kind of mechanism, whereas with us, it was brought in by stealth, but it is an actual black letter law that was enacted by our parliament. It's just that people didn't really understand what it was doing. But in Canada, can you just bring me through the timeline, how it came about, and were people aware at the time? Okay, so in Canada, we have provinces. So we have like our provincial laws and members of parliament, stuff like that. And then we have federal. So in Ontario, they changed our Ontario human rights. Um, they coined it actually the bathroom bill in 2012. Um, so that added gender identity and self-expression to Ontario's human rights code. And then BC followed and like it proceeded that way. And then the federal government put through bill C-16 in 2017, which was an act to amend the criminal code in two places, and also added gender identity and self-expression to the grounds of discrimination in the Canadian Human Rights Code. So in Ontario, they when they passed that in 2012, the, the provincial jails, so in Canada, we have provincial jails. Those are two years less a day. And then we have federal, and that's two years plus a day. So in provincial, they didn't actually change their policy until 2015. So they went from 2012 to 2015 without changing their 
um, corrections policy. And then in 2015, that's when they started transferring men who identified as women across the hall from us in jails. Um, and then in 2017 was when they started transferring men who identified as women into federal prisons in Canada. And for people who are new to this, um, what does that actually mean? So we, we're t we have to remind people we're talking about male, male fully full, male bodied men who identify as females um, locked in with women. So the women are in the care custody of the state or of the, of the province and the, the men are too, but the men are in locked in with women. So what does that look like in a prison? How does that, you know, how does it manifest? What happens day to day? Yes, so prior to this passing of this policy, we housed uh, trans women who had had surgery. They've been housed with women since at least 1982. So this actual policy that's been put in place has nothing to do with trans people. It's strictly gender identity or self-expression. And nowhere in our laws does it say that we have to treat any man who identifies or expresses himself as female and accommodate as female. It doesn't say that in the law. They've adopted this approach and implemented a policy based on self-ID. So they do have a duty to accommodate, right? But the, it, that doesn't mean that they have to accommodate like they are female, right? So day-to-day -day life inside prison now, depending on where you are, right? If you're provincial, federal, but I'm gonna talk about federal. Um, it's, we have three security classifications. So we have minimum, medium, and maximum. The men have that too, but our classification is less risk and less security than the men. So we have the same levels of classification, but different risk and security. So what's happening is, is there's a lot of men who identify as women in maximum security in men's prisons wanting to transfer, but women don't have that type of security. And a lot of them are coming in and they're medium security. So they're going on the medium compound and the compound is like a gated community except that they don't open the gate and let you out. So you have houses, you have a track, you have trees, like um, there's nine bedrooms in a house, two bathrooms, kitchen, um, and the guards only come through once every two hours and there's no cameras. So you're living in the same house with them, sharing the same bathroom, laundry room, cooking in the kitchen with them, all of those types of things. Um, and there's a lot of things that are able to go on because there's no guards or cameras, right? So um, I just uh, I, um, I just find that so so shocking. Um, you know, those women are in the custody of care of the state, and it's just like they've been abandoned, really. Um, um, it's just shocking. So. And so you obviously are in touch with female inmates um, and you advocate for them. What are they telling you? What are they telling you on the ground? So you've painted a story, a picture there, which is just absolutely shocking of unsupervised co-living in houses, um, trees, compounds, you know, just so many things could happen at any time and lack of supervision from guards. Um, so what are women who get in touch with you telling you about how this affects them? What's actually happening? It's not even just women that are incarcerated that are reaching out to me. Like correctional officers are reaching out to me, like all sorts of staff and other people are reaching out and they're saying the exact same things that the women have been telling me and that it's, it's out of control, um, that management doesn't know what they're doing that they don't know how to handle the situations that are arising. There's guards that are off. There's guards that are being physically attacked um, on top of the women too. So there's, um, the women are talking about being scared. It was funny because this woman reached out to me and I don't know her, but she was in Grand Valley prison. And she's like, I, I got to say something and I don't know how you feel about this, but 
they're not women. We're fighting men. And I just started laughing and I'm like, I know you're fighting men. <laughs> But she was so worried that she was going to say something and I was going to be like, how dare you call that person a man? Because that's how they're conditioned inside. We all are. We have to call them she, her, and we have to identify them as women or we're in trouble. So they're talking about, so with women, we're really, really catty. Like we do a whole lot of like arguing and like calling each other names and like you know, all that type of stuff. Like, Social conflict. Isn't that what they say that women do their conflict socially? Yeah. Yeah. Like out of all the time I've been in, I've only witnessed a couple fights and they're not even, I wouldn't even classify them as fights. Right. Um, but they're talking about putting soup cans in socks so that they can use them as weapons because they're like, we're literally fighting men. And so that's going on but they're being bullied, they're being threatened. Um, and also we have to think about how women who are prostituting or on drugs, the type of men that they have in their lives um, and the way that relationships are, they're toxic, right? They're violent. So when you start putting men in with women who have not healed, who have trauma, right? Um, it's the emotional manipulation and the control and the power that they have. And it's changed the entire dy dynamic inside the prison um, because there are groups of women that form around some of these men, right? And they date them. Like they're, they're literally engaged. They're holding hands, walking the compound. They're having sex in the house. Like it's full on co-ed relationships, pregnancies, STDs, like sexual assaults, physical assaults, like it's just, you, this is what it is. Okay, gated community from outside that has men, women, children, whatever, and it's inside, but they're all criminals. That's what it is. There isn't really a difference here. Mm -hmm. And there's no escape. Yeah. The women can't escape. No, and there's women talking about like their underwear going missing from the washing machine. Um, they're like they're they were talking about how there was a sexual assault in the bathroom in one of the houses, and the woman was taken out to um, the sexual assault clinic. The police were involved. They decided not to pursue charges, and this trans um, prisoner tried to go back to get into their house, and the women all locked the door and wouldn't let him in the house. So then the guards came and told the women that they had to let him in. And if they didn't, they were going to put bullying into their paperwork to prevent them from getting parole. So like, that's what people don't understand either is that CSC makes amendments in our parole decision and they put in what we're doing. So they use that as a way to control us, right? Because we all wanna get out, we want our kids, right? So they come along and they're like, well, we're gonna put bullying in your paperwork. You're not gonna get parole. So you're gonna do as you're told or, and that's what happens. And it happens a lot and people don't realize that. And they the also- system, The system is another layer of yeah. violence really towards women because of the gaslighting and because of the threats and they have all the power. So they can just yep. you know, give you a black mark and you won't see your children for another, you know, for more time. And what they're doing too is they're targeting women with longer sentences. Um, so like um, a, lot of the, a lot of the women that have been victims of this have actually been indigenous, which makes sense since they represent 42% of our prison population. So they're targeting women with longer sentences like lifers because they won't speak up because they really, really have to make sure that nothing gets put in their paperwork because they belong to CSC for life and people don't understand that. So they know that they're vulnerable um, and that they can enforce the ideology with those women the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what impact do you think it has um, apart from the psychological um, and physical threat and trauma the gaslighting I mean if women are already vulnerable and they'll be told no 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 that's not a man don't say man you know that's a woman what does that do do you think psychologically for women well what it's doing is conditioning them making it so that they listen do as they're told 
Um, so it's definitely, I find a lot of them don't want to speak out because they feel bad. Like, and they know that it's wrong what is happening, but they don't want to like stir the pot. They just want, and a lot like, none of the women that I've talked to are okay with this. Um, a lot of them are like, one, they're like, they're disgusted with what's going on there. The fact that like their friends are being harassed or, you know, that a lot of them are like hiding in their rooms. They don't want to come out because they just can't deal with the, the dysfunctional chaos that's now on the compound. They all say, Heather, it's not the same. It's not the same. And they use shit show uh, sorry for my swearing, but that's the word that they use to describe what's going on inside. It sounds like hell on earth, actually, for vulnerable women. Um, and what percentage, like, you don't have to give me, you know, if you don't have the data, but like, are you talking about, um, like, how many transidentified males does it take to have this kind of impact? You know, we're not talking about 50-50, we're talking about like a handful or, you know, because of the power dynamics, how many are we talking about in order to have this complete like you know it's turned the whole dynamic on its head really for those women in their own estate well our female prison population is very small we mm. only have about 693 women um, mm. federally sentenced across Canada so that is not a lot so if you were to look at Fraser Valley Prison for Women in British Columbia they have 92 people in there and five of them are trans like trans so trans make up 5.4% of the population of that women's prison already. Yeah. Yeah, because we found in Ireland, people say it's only this number, it's only this number, it's only one, it's only two, it's only, but you know, it's, it's about the impact on a tiny number of women. You know, in Ireland, we're talking about under 30 in Limerick. So yeah, I think that's really important as well to get across that it's the numbers relative to the numbers and it's within the context of the power dynamic that's already there and in the context of the complete lack of parity in terms of you're talking about a cohort of non-violent vulnerable prisoners and violent um, prisoners who are a threat to them. Um, now, that was really, really, really um, insightful, amazing to talk to you. Um, please hang loose until we come back to you at six o'clock and we'll join you then for a panel discussion. Speak All to right, you then. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Rona, how are you? Uh, hello everyone from Scotland. I'm very well, thank you. And just uh, really we thrilled. We speaking Irish, didn't we? Do you wish? Can I thought you? And what did you say? Can I thought you was? It was very similar. Say that again. Kimura Hashiv. Oh yeah. King Queen will too. Can I thought you? Yeah. It's all. This, it's very similar. Um, Rona. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Um, I don't think you need much of an introduction, but you're a former prison governor and an advocate for women and um, openly critical of the policy of mixed sex prisons. Um, but you weren't niche initially and have been on a journey with this. Um, firstly, can you tell me a bit about your background? How did you end up running prisons and what was your path to that point? Okay, well, I started out my professional life as a nurse and sort of rose through the ranks and became an advisor at Scottish Government on health care and quality. Mm. And then I ran a national unit for nurses and midwives, um, left that, became a management consultant, hated it and joined the prison service. Uh, prison service were recruiting for the first time ever um, at governor level. And I, I got in amazingly enough. So um, I had before that been, though, on the team of the chief inspector for prisons for a couple of years. So I was the healthcare advisor and healthcare inspector for prisons in Scotland. So that, that's how I got into it. And so you um, pioneered a trauma led approach um, because you were so well aware of the unique vulnerabilities of the, the female cohort in prison. Can you just explain that to us? What does that mean, a trauma-led approach, within the context, well, generally, and also within the context of a prison? So in, in terms of a prison, it's about recognising that the vast, vast majority of women who come into prison uh, will be suffering some kind of trauma, probably even PTSD, from a lifetime of abuse by men, uh, violent sexual abuse, the vast, vast majority of them. 
And it's about doing everything you can in prisons not to compound that trauma. So it's everything from how the staff dress to what they say to how they say it to the environment, to the processes and procedures and so on. So, for example, one of the things that we did when I was the governor at Cotton Vale was we introduced airport style scanners so that we no longer did routine strip searching of women. We introduced a no shouting policy in the, the and I mean the staff, <laughs> in the unit where the most disturbed women were so that we didn't re-traumatise them. Lots and lots of practical everyday things. And we asked women, what traumatized, what traumatized them about what we were doing to them in prisons to try and minimize that. And what did they tell you? So um, you reached out and, and you wanted to hear how they wanted um, their lives to run in prison. And what were the what was the feedback? What was interesting about that? Well, interestingly, a couple of big things for women. One of the first things was safety. So when we were looking at the design for the new women's prison in Scotland, the women told us quite clearly that they wanted to be seen by and see staff at all times to make them feel safe. Mm. Um, we asked them about what their ideal prison officer would be and what ratio of female staff there should be to men. And we were, we were expecting a lot of women to say, oh, we want an all female staff, but they didn't. Interestingly, they wanted some men on the staff because some of them related well. And in fact, some of the male officers were the first decent men they had ever met, um, but they didn't want men anywhere near intimate spaces. So obviously they didn't want men to be able to look in and see them using their toilet or their shower, things like that. So there were boundaries that they didn't want those men to cross. Um, and so you had done this research um, and, you know, we, we would probably say, or we would have all agreed certainly in the past that this was all absolutely common sense. And not only that, it was the fundamental basis of how we order society, how we safeguard, you know, we've always separated women in states of undress or vulnerability um, from men. That's just how every tribe does it. That's a normative thing. But now with this policy, it's been turned on its head. But initially when it started, um, you know, you, you've said, and I think this is um, extremely powerful, your honesty, that, you know, initially you did think it was the right thing for to do. Um, and I think it's really important um, that, you know, we're all aware of how um, um, compelling the narrative is initially, before we step back and start thinking critically, it is very compelling. It's about being kind. So can you just talk us through that, your kind of personal journey with regard to um, stepping back from the narrative or, or, or also obviously within your own work, realizing what was happening on the ground or the unintended consequences of it? Yep. So I had been in the prison service for about a year and a half and I was in charge of a male prison, the, the Berlini, the, the notorious prison in Scotland. And we got a call from the courts to say that there was a trans woman on their way to us. And this was someone who had lived um, as a trans woman in the community, but the judge or the sheriff, as they are in, in uh, Scotland, had decided they were coming to Berlini. In Scotland, unlike other, maybe some other places, it's got nothing to do with the courts, which prison someone goes to. It's entirely up to the prison governor, but he had said that they were to come to Berlini. And I thought this was absolutely appalling. And I arranged myself and another female manager um, to search this person if we had to. We cleared the reception area and I immediately arranged for them to be sent to the women's prison because I thought it was disgraceful that they were coming into a male prison when they were identifying as a trans woman. No gender recognition certificate. And there actually was no policy in the Scottish prison service at that time, probably principally because it was such an unusual thing. You know, you'd be lucky if you saw, you wouldn't even see one trans person a year and forget trans men, just never, ever, ever. You wouldn't even see one trans woman a year at a time. So I, God forgive me, <laughs> sent this person to the women's prison. Um, and um, had that person um, had surgery or were they um, a biological male sort of... Um, yeah. Yeah. the same as what we're dealing with now in the sort of the modern manifestation of this um and then what happened to make you change your mind and was that incremental or was it just a kind of damascan moment well there was there was some incremental stuff in it in that i became increasingly aware of the whole 
trans debate. So this would be 2012, 13, 14, when it was all really, the shit was just starting to hit the fan, really. And then in 2015, I went to be the governor of Conton Vale, which is Scotland's only exclusive women's prison. And part of my job there was to design the new women's estate. And we got a person, a man, in from a male prison who had decided that he would identify as female. So he was transferred to Cortonville, but he was put into the vulnerable prisoners unit. And within weeks of being there, he decided that he wanted to identify as male again and insisted that we transfer him back to the male estate immediately. And if we didn't, he would rape female prisoners and staff. And that was the threat. And I, I, was, I suppose it was a, it was a kind of damn moment. You know, the scales sort of fell from my eyes. And I thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. There is no way in God's earth. That's now. I never thought trans women were actually women, but I thought it was the sympathetic, the kind, the compassionate thing to do to treat them as though they were. But through meeting this person, who subsequently decided he was a woman again, by the way, once he got to the male estate. And it just, for me, exposed the stupidity of the whole thing. And the more trans women I met in prison, the more I became convinced that it was absolutely outrageous to put them in beside vulnerable, frightened, gaslit women. Yeah, and from what Heather was telling us, it sounds like they live in, or they have to live in a state of just hypervigilance, just constant um, fear. Um, in um, Scotland, have they tried to um, implement some gatekeeping around, say, sexual offences, or does that matter if you have had a conviction? Can you still be well, transferred? Yeah, in, in Scotland, the, the Scottish Prison Service, to their credit, would not, at the moment, transfer a trans woman who has a record of sexual offending against women to the women's estate. They, they wouldn't do it at the moment. I have known people who have had that way in their past transferred to the women's state but not current offences. However, one of the reasons that I started speaking out was that if gender self-ID becomes law in Scotland, the Scottish Prison Service will no longer have that power because if gender self-ID becomes law, then these people are for all intents and purposes women and we will, we, this will still work for them, the Scottish Prison Service will not be able to stop them coming to the women's estate, no matter what they've done, no matter what they're threatening, no matter how they are presenting. And that is, they can have beards, moustaches, male genitals, the whole lot, it won't matter. They will have to go to the women's estate. And currently, is it um, more of a medical model um, insofar as they have to have transitioned or no. want to transition? No. In all, of the, in all of the trans women I met when I was in prison, all of them I was aware of, uh, I only met one with a gender recognition certificate or who had had surgery. One. In fact, the one that had surgery might not even have had a certificate, but all of the rest of them, no gender recognition certificates. Most of them were not trans before they came in. Most of them made the decision that they were trans after they came in, and most of them were long-term prisoners. Um, there's a perception, I think, among these men, for they are men, that they'll get an easier time of it in the women's prison. Um, is that because women's prisons are just sort of softer, smaller? Um, there's less of a threat to them, obviously, if everyone else is a woman. Um, yeah. Do you think as well it's because they want to prey on women? I mean, is it a whole multitude of reasons behind this? It's exactly that. And do you know what? The, the main thing holding us back from having a really honest debate about all of this, it's the absolute claptrap from Stonewall. This acceptance without question and exception. That's what the big blocker is. If we could get to the place where people accepted that most of these men, in my opinion and experience, are not trans. They do not have gender dysphoria. They have no intention of living as trans women before or after they've been in prison. Then we could start to get somewhere. But people like Stonewall are blocking common sense at every turn. Yeah, we spoke to um, Fiona McEnena from Fair Play in our last um, yeah. webinar, and she said that their research showed 
that there was a cohort of male prisoners who, well, no, basically the data showed that there was an increase in Jewish observant prisoners and they looked into it um, and they were basing that on requests for kosher food. And they looked into it and it was simply because um, some of these male prisoners thought that food was better and they were going to just yeah of course i'll say i'm jewish to get the food and she said that even that cohort is are now the ones um saying they're trans because obviously they get they feel they get a much easier time yeah i would say that what you see quite a lot with people who identify as trans after they come into prison is they are arch manipulators of the system they're out to just bugger the system up if they can that is their their stated intent and we had a uh, person a man in the scottish prison system who had tried everything he could to annoy the hell out of the authorities so first of all he wanted to change his name to god almighty so that the staff had to refer to him as that so that he could humiliate them that wasn't allowed so he managed to change his name to mighty almighty and then when he got bored with that he decided he was trans now this was a person who was so dangerous that um the sheriffs didn't want him in court he assaulted a, a prison officer really seriously and they weren't going to charge him at all at first and then when they did charge him they didn't want him to come to court because he was so impossible to control but of course as soon as he said he was trans people started to take him seriously i was the governor in court and vale at the time and i remember saying to my deputy over my dead body is that fucking man coming to this prison. Apologies, folks. And as far as I know, he's still not there. If self-ID was in place, he would be, and I would have had no choice but to accept that man into the women's prison I ran. And I would have had to put him in the vulnerable prisoners unit because I think some of the other women might have um, had something to say about it. It, it. The whole thing is horrific. And you I should explain, you can't hold these people in segregation or separation or isolation or whatever you want to call it. You cannot hold them there unless they are presenting a real and present threat to the people around them. So if they're sensible, they go to separation for three days or seven days and they don't say anything and they don't act out of turn because that means you cannot hold them there any longer and you have to release them to the general prison population. So all this stuff about separating them off and segregating them, and it'll be the same in Ireland because this comes from the European prison rules. Um, all of that stuff about separation and segregation, it's not possible. You cannot separate these people off unless they do something like rape or assault someone. And um, when you talk about, you know, um if self-id comes in in scotland you will have no choice is that essentially what has happened in ireland because we have you know a legal scholar wrote a piece saying their hands are tied nobody thought about it you know mm -hmm. thought about this carefully in terms of this was likely to happen if anyone had really sat down and thought about um this um mechanism you know which is kind of built on creating an unreality whereby a piece of paper turns yeah. you magically from um, a woman, from a man to a woman in, in, in reality yeah. in law. Well, that's that's um, absolutely nobody thought it happened. through. But yeah. um, now in retrospect, it's so obvious that of course, um, criminal men were going to use it to their advantage. So mm -hmm. uh, looking at where you are now in Scotland and um, the slight bit of gatekeeping you do have within the model that you have, um, looking at Ireland, I mean, is it the case that in Ireland there's no other way to handle this because of our law, because of self-ID, because of the Gender Recognition Act? Yes, I believe so. And I believe that the trans organisation knew what they were doing when they sneaked it in in Ireland on the back of, I'm, I'm gay myself, but on the back of same-sex marriage, nobody really noticed it coming in. And that is, in fact, a tactic, and I'm going to sound paranoid here, but I'm not. There was a law firm in England whose advice to trans organisations was to keep it low profile, sneak it in if they could, uh, don't go on a lot of social media, don't bring attention to it. When the trans policy was written in the Scottish Prison Service, it was the stated intent of the Scottish Trans Alliance to try this out in prisons first, because they knew if they could get away with it in prisons, and after all, who gives a toss about women in prison? This was their way in, and that's exactly what they did. They sneaked it into prisons, and now they try to use prisons as a way of saying it's fine. And it kind of serves two purposes, because on one hand, you're going to get the less, the least flack possibly, which is so cynical, 
you know, we'll, we'll choose the most vulnerable cohort with the, the least agency and advocacy, mm -hmm. and we'll just um, test it out on them. Um, what can they do? And they're trapped. That's absolutely right. And then also, it becomes this strangely normative thing, you know, well, well, we don't know, nothing's going wrong in these prisons, so it's fine. So it works as a model for all of society. Mm -hmm. That is incredibly sobering. Um, now, there is a um, judicial case review that you've been involved in. Do you want to tell us about that? Um, the Women yeah. for Scotland judicial case review? For Women in Scotland, there was a, they've just lost a judicial review. The Scottish government, um, in legitimate efforts to make public bodies, uh, the boards of public bodies gender balanced, say that they have to be 50% women, 50% men. But they then went on to say that the 50% women could be trans women. So for women in Scotland took them to court and lost. So now we have the terrible spectre of some SNP politicians saying that a board that is made up of 50% men and 50% trans women is gender balanced. So that's how far the madness has gone. I think there's a I believe the Scottish Prison Service is already breaking the law because their own rules say that females and males must be accommodated separately. And yet they are allowing, at the moment, self ID'd trans women to share accommodation with women. But trying to get anybody to respond to that, the Justice Minister is stonewall deaf in Scotland, I'm afraid, um, and just will not listen to any of these arguments. We had the horrible experience of our Justice Minister saying that uh, refugee and asylum seeker women should not be accommodated with men because they were vulnerable and traumatised. But he does not afford the same care and concern to women in prison. He's absolutely right about asylum seeking women and refugee women, but he does not extend that same care and concern to women in prison because nobody really cares about them. Yeah, that disconnect we see elsewhere, um, for instance, with Amnesty advocating for single sex toilets for women and girls in the global south, but um, advocating for the opposite, for mixed sex, for the end of single sex provision for women sure. in developing countries. Um, it's extraordinary how um, compelling and powerful this ideology is um, beyond all kind of normal um, sort of tenets of common sense and the way we've always ordered the world really. Um, if you um, stick with us, we're going to come back and have a kind of panel chat at around uh, 20 minutes. If you hang okay. me, I'm going to go to Garage. Thanks, Rona. Hi, Garage. How are you? How are you? Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes, perfectly. So um, let me just introduce you first in case um, people didn't catch you at our International Women's Day conference. Um, Garroge is an Irishman living in Bogota, Colombia. He works with male um, prisoners in, for a human rights organization and is, is a former board member of the Irish Penal Reform Trust. Um, Garroge, can you tell us about your research? Um, you did some writing for the Countess in this field. Um, you've been openly critical about this policy in Ireland of housing trans-identified males with women in the female estate. You're very unusual in that regard because it would appear that even um, the sort of reformer organizations in Ireland, as well as the state and the, the department are all fully captured, fully on board with this idea. Um, so can you just talk us through your own um, views on this policy? Yeah, um, I mean, like I said, at the last event, the when I came across the Barbie Kardashian case, I sort of felt, well, you know, the Penal Reform Trust would surely have something to say about this. And I went onto their website and uh, they did have something to say, just that what they had to say was a complete abandoning of their role, that everything that they had advocated for years around uh, penal reform. So they did this report that highlights issues around violence in prisons, which is real, not just for trans prisoners, it's real for every prisoner. You know, prisons are dangerous places. Um, you know, even, even the most secure prison unit, you run, uh, you, you run certain risks. Um, 
And they'd also abandoned issues around, they'd highlighted, for example, the dangers of overcrowding in prisons, um, and that trans prisoners then being forced uh, to share a cell with somebody they were uncomfortable with. And that's fine, you know, I mean, like, um, no, no prisoner should have to share a cell with someone that they're not comfortable with. No prisoner should have to share a cell, full stop. One of the big uh, progressive measures at the end of the 1700s when Britain had its first really big wave of uh, prison building in which John Howard, who's after which the Howard uh, League, the, that penal reform institution in Britain is named, one of the big things was they introduced this concept which was being introduced around Europe at the time was a cell, single cell occupancy. And that's been a constant um, in theory, not necessarily in practice, um, through British um, and Irish and even um, you know, other parts of the world uh, history that you, know, you have a single cell and it's for safety purposes as, as well. It's not just a question, there are elements of dignity involved in that not having to share um, the, the, the cell but the, um, so they'd abandoned that, you know, and they'd actually, you don't solve the problems of overcrowding and the violence inherent in that, because overcrowding leads to all sorts of other problems in a prison. Um, it leads to all sorts of other problems in any institution. If you could even just, even just in terms of uh, feeding prisoners, yeah? you, know, you have a capacity uh, in an institution and if you double that or increase it by 20%, well, that puts a strain on all points within our institution. And they'd abandoned all of this in favor of, we'll solve the problem for violence against trans prisoners by putting them into women's prison, uh, prisons, um, instead of actually arguing for proper penal reform. And, you know, one of the things, and I was just be before in the run-up to this talk, I was looking again at the statistics in Ireland you know, almost 30% of prisoners in Ireland are serving less than three months. 54% are serving less than six months. And a fully 75% of prisoners are serving less than 12 months. One of the big problems in the Irish prison system, which is not necessarily replicated in other parts of the world, it's not replicated here in Colombia at least, um, is the overuse of short sentences, um, you know, for, for minor crimes, which could be dealt with in other ways, but the other ways require, uh, well, they require money, but then a prison requires money as well. But if you're gonna use things like, I don't know, community service or something like that, you actually have to think about that. There's, there's a strategy involved. Uh, you know, you have to put some thought into it. Whereas if you lock someone in a, in, in a cell, well, the prison officers don't forget about them. They can't, they have to deal with them on a daily basis, but the actual, government, the, the setup, out of sight and out of mind. Whereas if you have a community service program or some other alternative to prison for these minor offences, you have to put a lot of work and thought into it. How cheap it is is another question or not, but you actually have to do that. So I was really, really surprised that they just abandoned on the altar of uh, trans rights as they're referring to it. Uh, they had abandoned any notions of uh, advocating for penal reform. Because all the problems that they highlight for trans prisoners exist for every prisoner in 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 the country. Um, so their 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 position um, is you know predicated on research, which they say shows how uniquely vulnerable trans-identified male prisoners are. But from your work on the ground with male prisoners, um, do you think that? Um, holes at all um, and who is vulnerable in prison and why every well everyone's vulnerable in prison you know? um if if everyone wasn't vulnerable in prison then um, prisons would have a prison would have a different design the guards would have a different uh, type of remit yeah um but when you look at uh for example some of the reports done in the United States in juvenile detention facilities, um, what they find, and this almost is almost logical when you think about it, people with mental health problems are far more likely to be victims of sexual assault 
than people who don't have them. But also they found that people who have physical disabilities were also more likely to be victims of um, sexual assault in prisons. Yeah? And alongside that, there are, in some cases, you find that um, people who, for example, who've committed sex crimes are also, um, well, they're likely to commit them again in prison if they get a chance, but they're also actually victims. They're likely to be victimized in that manner. But one of the things that um, is often forgotten when we're talking about sexual assault in prisons is that most of the victims are male heterosexuals and they're victimized by other male heterosexuals. Right? This is, um, this is a, a reality around the world. And you don't solve that by taking a group of these male heterosexuals who identify as women and putting them into a prison. That's not, you know, um, the, you know, it's not, it is, as I, as, I, as I said before, sexual assault in prison is very much like sexual assault outside of prison. It's about power. It's about violence. It's not about sex. Yeah? Um, this is part of the myth about um, violence in prisons. Um, a lot of these uh, sexual assaults on males by other males are questions of relation to power and se uh, sexual assault was also meted out as a punishment. And um, with regard to um, sex offenders, um, they are represented at a higher rate amongst transidentified males, um, much higher rate than the normal population. So that's either that that means that um, they're pretending to be trans, or that they, um, you know, either there are more that are trans, or they're pretending to be trans, and they're just sex offenders pretending to be trans in order to um, serve their time in the in the women's estate. But what does that mean? Whether whichever of those holds true, what does that mean in terms of um, any hope of rehabilitating um, the sex offenders? I mean, is it possible at all if they actually don't even, if they identify as the opposite sex, how then does that work? Uh, well, the, you know, um, lots of programs that deal with uh, crimes, yeah? Or even, you know, any, any form of rehabilitation, you know, if you think about people who are alcoholics, they have to actually recognize that that's what they are, yeah? that they have a problem with alcohol or with drug abuse before they seek treatment. If you're a sex offender and you're involved in some sex offender program in prison or even outside of prison, um, you actually have to recognize the nature of your crime. And the nature of your crime is male sexual violence committed against women. Right? It's not um, a woman assaulting another woman, which can and does happen. Yeah. You know, this, you know, sexual assaults by women on other women uh, in prison does happen, but the percentages and the numbers involved are nowhere near comparable to those uh, of males. Not even, not just in terms of somewhere like the United States, where uh, violence in prisons is just off the scale. Even if you look at the at the figures, for example, in Britain and, and that, um, the it's just not the same. But again. Uh, you can't have a proper rehabilitation program for sex offenders if some of those sex offenders don't recognize the nature of the crime. And the impact on the victim, you know, a, a victim trying to come to terms with violence of any nature, but particularly sexual violence, eh, um, needs to know, you know, needs to overcome what happened to them. And if you tell them, no, 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 it's not like you remember. You weren't assaulted by a man. You were assaulted by a woman. You're just, you know, you're on a back foot. You're never going to deal with the trauma of what happened to you if you are forced to pretend that the nature of the crime committed against you was different to that which you experienced. And it's another layer of abuse, arguably. Yes, it is. <laughs> to say that your rapist was a woman. Um, with regard to your work in Colombia, um, how are transidentified males um, dealt with by the prison authorities in Colombia? Um, are there 
cultural differences? Um, is there self-ID in Colombia? Can you just talk us through the, the, the policies on the ground there? Yeah, there is a self-ID in uh, Colombia. It comes from a decree. We have different types of laws, a different legal system here. You have laws that are called organic laws, which are passed by uh, Congress. And then decrees that presidential dictates, basically. Uh, but they have the force of law. Uh, they don't override laws. They can't override laws passed by the Congress. They, they generally actually tend to regulate other laws. Um, so there is a the gender ID from 2018. Um, but prisoners are held according to their sex. Now, I did come across recently talking to a, a female prisoner that I interviewed recently. And she told me that actually in the women's prison that she was in, there was one trans man, but nobody's been actually able to explain to me how or why that happened. So I don't know whether it was the result of confusion when the gender ID law came in. But trans prisoners are held in the estate to which they, their sex belongs to, so, which is basically men, right? Men are held in the men's prison. And here in Bogota, in the main prison, the Icota, the trans prisoners are held in the male estate and they, you know, they do suffer problems, but the problem is that they could suffer the same type of problems that everybody else suffers in, a, in prison here in Colombia. You know, getting medical attention in Colombia in a prison is a nightmare. Prisoners actually sometimes uh, cut themselves just so as they can get to see the doctor. Because once you cut yourself, the prison staff have to bring you to the doctor. And then you're there and you say, well, yeah, my arm's bleeding. But while I'm here, I have all these other symptoms. Would you mind uh, dealing with them as well? So trans prisoners would have all sorts of stuff like that. Now, they did allow... Um, Trans prisoners are now allowed to bring in female um, uh, stuff. So makeup, things like that. Yeah? They're allowed to have them in the male estate. That's one of the concessions. And in one prison, again, talking to a prisoner actually just in the, the last few days, there were two trans uh, prisoners in the prison that he was in. And they put them, they separated them. Right? They um, not into isolation wings or you know punishment wings or anything like that and uh, they just they separated them by category and they put them into a section of the prison that was colloquially known as the cages but despite its name the conditions in that part of the prison were actually far superior to the conditions for the uh, general prison population mm -hmm. in general terms they're they form part of the male estate and they mix really i mean i did come across one case where a former, well, he wasn't former at the time. He was a leader, a commander of the FARC guerrillas. Um, he left his wife and he got into a relationship with a trans woman who was on the same wing as him. And I know actually now that they demobilized, the FARC were released, his partner was released and they lived together in one of the demobilization camps um, about four or five hours in Bogota. Um, but so would that be typical as in um, trans-identified males who are homosexual, who are attracted to other males? And is it also typical that the cohort of trans-identified males in Colombia are not requesting to transfer to the female estate? So you're just not faced with that problem that's playing out in other jurisdictions? Yeah, well, I haven't been aware of it um, as, you know, a, a major demand. There are some academic uh, academics who've argued for this. There is a organization called Colum Colombia Diversa, Diverse Colombia, and they've argued for greater rights for trans, but there's been no big movement as of yet to put them into a female estate. Now, Colombian, Colombian prisons are extremely violent yeah and if you were to transfer um large numbers of men into the women's estate that would present an immediate and huge problem for the prison staff and also for the prisoners but if one man or two men were to be transferred into a female estate um to be very honest i wouldn't um I, 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 depending on the prison, I might be concerned for their own safety as well, because we actually live in a very violent country where 
resort to violence is sometimes the first recourse that people have. I did come across a case in the Cucapa prison on the Venezuelan border, where a woman who um, was coming towards the end of her sentence, she should have been released as part of the peace deal with the FARC guerrillas. And when I saw her, I said, you know, why is she here? She, she surely should have been released as part of the deal. And they said, yes, but um, there was another woman in the prison who was getting unmerciful harassment from another female prisoner. And uh, she decided to kill the harasser. Right? Um, and we live in a society where that's, uh, that's a viable option, shall we say, it's a feasible option for a number of people. So as a short term measure, um, it wouldn't necessarily, you know, I would also be con have concerns for some of them. If one man was in a prison and decided to throw his weight around, you know, he might hear in the context of Colombia, the very violent context that we have here, um, come up against violence himself. But obviously, if huge numbers of men or even a group of men would be put into the prison, that would represent a huge huge problem for women here, particularly in a very violent society and a very sexist society. I mean, when we look at sex offenses in terms of statistics here in Colombia, um, they're actually quite low in terms of the overall prison population. But that's not the case in terms of how many sexual offenses uh, forensic medicine, the forensic medicine department here in the country carries out each year, they carry out tens of thousands. So they're being raped and then murdered, essentially. The no, well, no, the forensic medicine, here in Colombia, if you're assaulted, you, you report to forensic medicine. They do a, a medical, even for a common assault, they will do an examination of you. Um, and even for a workplace accident, uh, you report to forensic medicine. But for sexual assault, they carry out tens of thousands of exam examinations each year. And the level of impunity for those crimes is huge. So, you know, the, if, that's, if that's the case outside of prison um, and where these crimes go unpunished and where they're frequently justified um, by society, uh, you know, and openly so, you know, another part, well, I've been out of Ireland a long time, so I'm not really sure about the attitudes to these, these type of crimes. But here, a lot of, a lot of assaults on women even just uh, non-sexual assaults, right? common assault on women, will be justified by uh, wide sections of society. You put men into a women's prison, they're closed off or shut off from the rest of the world. And the relationship of prison guards in Colombia is not good in any prison. Um, so the idea that you might actually seek recourse in the prison guards for protection, will be, it's just laughable. No, you, you wouldn't do it. If you were to seek recourse in a prison guard here, you're actually making yourself more vulnerable than you would in a, by sorting it out yourself or getting other people in the prison to help you sort it out. Mm. Yeah, so if there's um, a rape culture or a misogynistic culture that's going to just be augmented inside where you know, you're essentially putting the fox in with the chickens in the chicken coop. Um, Basically. Going back to Ireland, I mean, how do you think we got here, just in terms of um, specifically the capture of um, organizations like the Irish Penal Reform Trust, who, you know, their, their work is um, illustrating sort of um, essentially levels of vulnerability among um, the prison population. And they say things like um, trans-identified prisoners are more vulnerable than um, mothers or even pregnant women in prison. So, you know, how did we get here with regard to that level of um, cognitive dissonance, really, you could call it, and absolute capture of um, organizations, agencies, whereby they really believe that's true? Uh, do they believe that true? it is true, or are they just kind of going along with it because it's, um, you know, um, the yeah, sort of. Well, I think thing to think at the moment. Yeah, well, I think part of it goes back as well to what Rona was saying, her mm -hmm. first experiences in, you know, as a, as a prison official, yeah? that 
it's a sympathetic thing to do initially you sort of think you know and i think a lot of us who have met um, trans people you know it's, it's a sympathetic thing to do you're nice etc cetera, etc cetera. and you don't and i certainly didn't um because i do know trans people here in colombia i didn't think beyond into the policy aspects you know it's one thing to treat a person on an individual level and um, because they're a friend of yours and you say well yeah okay i'll refer to you as a woman if you want and which in Spanish, it's, it's really complicated not to and um, a person's self ideas. It's, um, but um, there's a certain level of that. Um, it's part of the zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. And, also, um, and also there's a question, um, where do you get your money from? And do you, do you fear that uh, funders may stop giving you money if you don't come on board with this issue? Yeah. You know, if your organization Let's imagine a situation where the Amnesty International, who are also on board with this whole policy, right, turns around and publicly denounces the Irish Penal Reform Trust as a transphobic organization. What might happen to the funds? Will some will people uh, stop funding them? Because they were getting, uh, you know, when I was on its board, I was only on its board for a year before I came out to Colombia. They were getting a lot of uh, they were getting money from Atlantic Philanthropies, uh, Chuck, Chuck Feeney in the United States, if I remember rightly. Um, so if you're getting money from you know private donors, and the zeitgeist is, yeah, trans men, trans women are. I keep making that mistake. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you think about it, and um, that trans women are are women, and you say no, and you advocate against it. So people might cut off your funding, mm-hmm. you know, and if you, if you get any level of um, government funding for anything ever, that can dry up as well. You know, um, are you going to be invited onto boards? Are you going to be consulted? Um, ma- let make um, presentations for reform of the prison system if you're, you know, considered to be a transphobic organization. And I think that's part of it. There's a, uh, initially there might have been, an, they just didn't think it through. Yeah. That's, uh, that's going to get part of the problem. Um, generally, not, I mean, prisons are perhaps the most um, extreme or egregious example of how this impacts women. Um, but in general, that's probably, I would say, one of the key issues we face is that it's seen as, um, from the point of view only of the trans-identified person and not seen in the round, not looking at the impact on everyone else in society only and not looking at practice and policy and taking looking at that where we end up if we um, allow men to identify as women and access their spaces. Um, I'm just going to open up the panel again to everyone. If you can all um, unmute, please, and we'll um, come back and have a round table. Right. So um, we were talking there about capture, and I think that's very, very important um, for us all to um, be aware of. Um, I mean, this was brought in by stealth in, in, in all of our jurisdictions. Um, my first question is really, um, well, to all of you separately, um, you know, I see a lot of similarities, firstly, Rona with Ireland and Scotland, insofar as, you know, we're both small countries. There's a sense there of, um, you know, a post-colonial attitude, um, uh, well, no, a, a, a sort of wanting to differentiate from the former colonial power, shall we say. So, you know, um, certainly there seems to be a sense of, I want to be seen as more progressive. And I think possibly, Heather, with Canada, it's trying to differentiate themselves from America. We are much more progressive. We're, you know, we're really kind and we're um, um, progressive, um, but without thinking it through in terms of practice and policy. Um, do you think that's part of how this has happened? Um, Rona, we'll come to you first. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think there's a there's been a move in Scotland over the over the past decade or so um, towards a sort of Scottish exceptionalism, where uh, we've almost started to define ourselves as not being as backward as some countries in terms of uh, human rights and so on. And for me, this is why this has gathered such momentum in Scotland because people genuinely want Scotland to be a welcoming, open, eco-socialist country. And it's partly as a as a sort of um, 
I don't know, a response to the way we see things going on. Scotland has never returned a Tory government for about 50 years, whereas they have a very irritating habit of doing it all the time in England. So I think it's just part of this roller coaster where people have just thought it's the right thing to do. And I don't blame them. I did at one point as well. But there's the trans lobby have also been really, really successful at trying to say that trans rights are the new gay rights and the arguments against the advance of trans rights are like section 28 you know the the kind of anti-gay arguments that there were in the 80s and 90s and in fact that's why stonewall has morphed into a trans organization because they ran out of things to to campaign on they were they did not campaign for trans issues till 2015 and i think it's because they were kind of floating around feeling a bit lost because an awful lot not all but an awful lot of the arguments have been won so i think it's been done on the back of that an awful lot of people who are accepting this are just good decent people who want to do the right thing and they are being hoodwinked and gaslit by trans organizations and gender extremists yes i think that's so true um i do think in ireland um whilst it probably wasn't thought through properly and should have been, and women should have been at the table as stakeholders. Uh, when it was brought in, I do think a lot of people uh, came from a place of compassion, for sure. Um, Heather, how did it come in? Um, what, do, what is your take on why Canada has, you know, some people call Canada Tranada, like it's just gone with this ideology, you know, full, full, you know, full speed really over the edge of the cliff. Um, you've described, you know, um, you know, with horror, I think we all felt just um, the um, end of the trajectory if we keep going along this pathway where we'll end up. Um, but why do you think Canada is so set on these policies? I find that Canada likes to follow. Um, like Canada is always the peacekeeper, human rights, this, that, we're the leader, like look at us, we're so wonderful. And um, and I find that a lot of people too aren't really aware of what's going on. So in Canada, the mantra is always trans rights are human rights. But what people don't understand is our legislation has nothing to do with trans people. It has to do with gender identity or self-expression. That's not trans. That's a, an expression of how you want to dress or wear makeup or hair or how you want to identify yourself from one day to the next. It has absolutely nothing to do with actual trans people who suffer gender dysphoria. Um, and I think people are being confused by that. And also with all our trans activists, they're really loud, but um, Canada, it's not in our, our charter, like it's not in our federal legislation or our provincial, it's in our human rights code. Our human rights act does not supersede our charter, right? Our, our Canadian charter of freedoms and rights is the supreme law of the land. We have sex as a protected characteristic under the charter. Gender identity or self-expression isn't. And what I find here in Canada is that a lot of us are really, well, I say us, are not, they are for sure. They're very timid and they're cowards, right? Everyone's scared of what people are gonna think about them or what they're gonna say about them or they're, they're worried. Um, honestly, they're really worried about what other people think and we need more people that don't care, right? Um, because all we do need is somebody that is willing to do the research um, and do a charter challenge, do a, a civil suit, like do a human rights claim. Um, a lot of women just don't, they don't do that stuff. That's something the men do so much of. Like we're seeing it a lot right now. There's a lot of human rights claims right now for trans women that usually get taken care of before they make it to court. But men are always on that. They're always like doing that legal stuff and we just don't. So like in Canada, it's not a law. It is a policy and a practice that these institutions and organizations have adopted and implemented. It's not, they have no leg to stand on if somebody actually decided to fight it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's remarkable to me when you um, put it that way, because it reminds me of, you know, in Ireland, um, 
there was no law that made, for example, um, the, the state and the community and society and the church um, incarcerate women who got pregnant out of wedlock and take their babies, but it went on for 80 years, you know, and maybe some people did really believe in that ideology, but I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people just said, well, oh, maybe everyone else does, or, you know, I just want to keep my head down and I'm not going to say anything, or I can't say anything. It's not up to me to do anything. Um, in England, in terms of um, test cases, though, in England, they have been very, very successful in breaking it down into different areas of practice and policy and challenging them fairly locally as well. I mean, you're probably all aware of um, a judicial case review that's ongoing at the moment where uh, a woman who was um, attacked was, was a allegedly raped by a trans-identified male um, in prison is now challenging that actual policy. Um, do you think this will have an impact globally if it goes in, in her favour um, in terms of that judicial case review? Um, is there a, rip, a ripple effect from those challenges? Um, or do you think that jurisdictions, unlike the UK, the UK has kind of pulled back from the edge as such, but the jurisdictions um, like Ireland, like Canada, which are just galloping full speed. Um, do, can they, will they take note? Um, do you think it is having an impact, even if it's not percolating up into the public sphere at the moment? Yeah, Canada usually follows presidents from the UK, right? We used to be Commonwealth. Um, so if we don't have presidents in Canada, we typically look to the United States, Australia, and um, the UK. What did the panel think? Do you think that the work that's happening on the ground uh, with regard to this policy in the UK, do you think you know, other countries are taking note? I mean, you said, Rona, about exceptionalism, Scottish exceptionalism. Do you think that there is a cohort who are actually paying attention and looking at, you know, for example, the you know, um, liability, you know, any, this policy le does leave, um, um, issues of liability unresolved. Um, so clearly if a woman in England is taking a case and it's successful, surely other jurisdictions must be looking and taking note and, and wondering, are we leaving ourselves wide open? Well, um, of course, any um, ruling made in England doesn't cover Scotland. Mm. And it's a sort of um, not sure which way it would go because Scotland might again, or at least the SNP government might decide that to push Scottish exceptionalism to the fore again, and they could react against it and dig their heels in in Scotland. But the Scottish courts do pay attention to rulings from other jurisdictions. But even if they didn't, it's worth it because every time something like this hits the headlines, another few people are peak trans and another few people uh, think to themselves, that's outrageous, a woman goes to prison and is raped by a man. Unfortunately, the other side of the argument will come back with things like, you can't judge all trans women on one woman, and, uh, you know, it's the prison's fault, they should have made them safe. I actually submitted a statement in support of that case in England, which I can't quote from because it's, it's still ongoing, but um, I think, and Heather will agree with me on this, it's not even it's not even the big things like rape and so on. It's the small, insidious things. It's the hypersexualized behavior. It's the intimidation of women. It's trans women using their bulk and their strength, not necessarily to assault women, but to intimidate them and to frighten them and to re-traumatize them. And I saw that time and time again, women distressed because there were men in their spaces, men who frightened them, men who took them back to past traumas and men who set their progress back just by being there and by being intimidating. So we shouldn't always just look to the dramatic ones like rape and assault, which do happen, but it's this small, it's this insidious drip, drip, drip of having these big drips in beside them, you know, who frighten them and intimidate them and they just can't understand why they're there. Yeah, I think that's really important that, um, and I always say that about single sex spaces, um, generally, the bar is not trauma. You know, women don't deserve single sex spaces and they shouldn't and they mustn't lay out, um, you know, their lives trauma in order to justify them. We require them by law. They are granted to us by law. And, you know, as an organization, we are calling on the Irish state to uphold the protections and freedoms and rights accorded to women, um, you know, as part of our equality legislation. Uh, we fa face something 
um, which is very concerning, which is an amendment, which is essentially what Biden has just done in the US, an amendment to our equality legislation to include gender identity as a grounds. Um, it's my view that, that that would essentially make it impossible um, for me, for example, I have three small girls, to defend a female space against male incursion. Um, it's essentially criminalizing the defense of a female space against male incursion because the gender identity of that man will trump um, the, the, you know, the, the gender. Because in Ireland, they don't actually say sex, they say gender, which I think is probably to do with uh, coyness around the word sex, but it does put us even further on the back foot because it's not a ground um, gender is. Um, but our um, goal as an organization is uh, essentially to um, either seek legal judicial case review or simply through um, a shift in popular opinion, um, public opinion, which is happening already. Um, we want to see um, the gender recognition act amended to include um, safeguards, medical gatekeeping, criminal gatekeeping, legal gatekeeping. But also it's, it's more than that. It's also looking at these bills. Um, you'll probably all recognize these bills. I call them the template bills because they're all just cut and paste bills that are pushed out top down all over the world. And for me, they um, enforce the ideology because it has to be brought in by stealth because people are, it's so deeply unpopular. And when people find out about it, they're not happy. And then you have these kind of slew of bills which enforce it. So hate crime obviously um, criminalizes um, dissent by creating, you know, um, sort of discussions around um, um, biological sex as being transphobic. Um, um, the anti-conversion therapies bill, which obviously forces therapists to um, affirm gender non-confirming patients. Um, and then you've indoctrination of young people. We are also looking at the expansion of self-ID to children in this country. And then the big, the meta one really, which is yes, which I just said, the amendment of, gen of our equality legislation to include gender identity. Um, but in terms of prisons, um, for me, you know, um, the first time when we launched back in September, um, the very first tweet I wrote was, you know, if nobody else will speak for the women in Limerick prison, we will. Um, so what do you think activists, um, activists, individual activists and, you know, uh, advocacy groups like ourselves can do now in the first instance, you know, obviously we talked about legal challenge, uh, raising awareness. Um, like Heather, what protests have you been doing? Have you been involved in? And do you think there is a shift on the ground in Canada in terms of public opinion and awareness? Yeah, um, I've been protesting outside of the prison that I was actually incarcerated at. So I protested in the last two and a half weeks. I've been there twice. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's really good. Like we have support from the guards. We have support from the actual prison volunteers, the church groups, like they're all out there. Um, nobody actually agrees with this. Um, they're just, they don't speak up about it, um, or they work behind the scenes, but I haven't actually met anybody in real life who is in agreement with what is happening. Um, I have noticed though, that a lot more people are starting to notice, um, like tons and tons of like friend requests, emails, DMs. Um, like journalists, members of parliament, um, news, like everyone has been contacting me like all week. It's just every single day. It's uh, an interview or a conversation with somebody. So it's definitely picking up in Canada. And um, actually the newspaper just called me yesterday or the day before and wanted to ask me for my comment because I have upset the LGBTQ community and men who identify as women and still have their penis in particular and they said that I was anti-trans mm -hmm. and so the news called me to ask me for my comment to defend myself and I'm like what what is anti-trans that men are allowed to identify as women or that men are allowed to identify as women and then sexually assault women in prison. Please explain. 
Yeah, I think we all have to remember here and generally that, you know, our position is not um, extreme or fringe and nine out of 10 people completely agree with this position and that men, regardless of how they identify, should not be in female spaces. Um, it's been amazing talking to you all. It is really, really powerful to all of us, for, for all of us to remember that we are part of a global grassroots resistance to um, gender ideology. Um, and it's been really inspiring. I want to thank you all for taking the time to take part today. Um, I would love to do this on a monthly basis, if you're free. We can check diaries later, but um, we, will, uh, we intend to look at these issues uh, once a month, um, every Friday, this, you know, every four weeks. So um, hopefully at, some of you at least will come back and take part in that panel. Um, in the meantime, please everyone, um, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has, it'll have a recording of this um, and also subscribe to our mailing list to keep informed of all our work on the ground in Ireland and our campaigns. Thank you very much for joining me today, Gurv Magath, and have a lovely weekend, everyone. Thank you.